and so what we're going to be talking about today um, is we're going to be talking about um, some last minute genetic disorders here. We, we, we we're kind of finishing that up from our mutations. We actually get into this in more detail. Um, but I just wanted to talk about, I think, four slides to talk about where these come from. Um, and then I wanted to spend some time to talk about the data. And now the data is actually quite important because you know, all the data, that, all, all the, um, the, the knowledge that we have in bioinformatics um, basically comes from the exploration of data. And so that is why we're going to spend some time talking about data. So I wanted to, first of all, just to talk about uh, one big question, and this question came um, after class. Um, it, was a, it was a direct slack to me, and somebody asked, um, where do some of these mutations actually come from? I mean, how do we, how do we track these mutations? Um, and I wanted to talk about what's called the inheritance factors of, of types of, of, of genes, um, and that is that uh, the question was actually, does that, if, if somebody has, let me get this right here, if somebody has a um, genetic um, mutation, does that mean that, that they were responsible for that genetic mutation, or could that mutation have come from somebody else? And this is a, um, a family tree which suggests that, that um, not everybody who has a genetic mutation um, actually has that mutation from, they, they didn't give it to themselves. In other words, they inherited this. And so this is actually a very big piece of bioinformatics, um, which is to discuss the inheritance factor, or <coughs> excuse me, or the the chances of receiving a mutation if perhaps one of the um, if one of the parents of uh, a child has that that mutation. And so in this thing here, we see that there is a these um, this is a, a family tree, but we see the, the mother and the father, and the mother has uh, this is a, a it looks like a normal chromosome that's supposed to be a chromosome which is basically what the DNA is wrapped around when it's in its stable form. But the father, on the other hand, is affected with something. It has, uh, he has some kind of a, a defective copy of a gene. So this could be cystic fibrosis, this could be something else, maybe this is, um, I don't know, is it sickle cell anemia, anything. Uh, it's some defective copy of a gene. And one thing I'll say though is it doesn't necessarily mean that it's like one base is corrupt or, or is misplaced or whatever it is. Um, in this case, it means that the gene does not work. It's like a, it, it does not produce correct code or correct protein. And so under this model here, you have these, um, you're looking at the statistical probabilities of those, of that gene uh, being spread to all of these children here. And so you can see that in this particular case, uh, two of the children out of the, out of the four are affected with this disorder. And you can have, for instance, these other two children who are normal, which basically have, um, they, they got lucky. Statistically, they got lucky, and that is that they did not inherit this, um, this, this, this broken copy of a gene. So what's actually going on here um, is that when you are, um, when, when, you are uh, when you are conceived or when an offspring is conceived, uh, the genes are rearranged in um, a kind of a random way. So that you have pieces of, the, pieces of the mother's genes, pieces of the father's genes coming together and mixing in such a way so that you have traits of your mother and traits of your father, and I think we've all heard this before. But in addition to all those traits, you also have the genes and the copies of the genes that either work or they don't work. Um, and so some of the genes will transfer to children. So you're either your so when you're, if your father has a has a corrupt gene or your mother has a corrupt gene, then for instance, it's very likely that the children will get it. Now the actual bioinformatics um, effort here uh, is to determine. Uh, what are the probabilities of that gene actually spreading to the the children? I mean, how many, uh, how many, when you have, what what kinds of chances do they have to to receive this this thing? And so, if you have if you're a family, and say the mother is uh, diabetic and the children are, um, let's say that there's a uh, uh, you know, two children uh, and they've just been born. Um, what are the chances that those children are going to be diabetic? And if you think that those chances are going to be high, based upon the um, you know, the statistics of the of the of, 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 of the, you know, the I guess the proliferation of that gene, um, then you should you should start doing tests early on. Um, it depends what those tests are for the children, but you know, sometimes they're, they're you know, I mean sometimes these tests are actually kind of scary for children, so you, you wait for some time. But if it's urgent, then you should check early. Anyway. Um, this is what's, so the other was, this is what was called an, an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance, where the children, either you get it, um, if, you're, if it's, uh, uh, if, if, you know, for these uh, <laughs> child I've never received it or not, you, you either get it um, or you don't, 
Or for instance, in here, you have, um, you have the autosomal recessive inheritance. So for, for, the, for the dominant means that when you have it, you express it, you're affected. And over here, the autosomal recessive is that you can get the bad gene, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are showing that you have the bad gene. It's like, for instance, you're a carrier. And that's a big difference here. So you can see that in this case here, these children are affected because they um, are carrying this gene. That gene makes, it, makes, things, makes things bad. And the, idea, and the idea is that you have two copies of each gene, one from the mother, one from the father. And if the copy from the father is bad, then, then that's the gene that's being used in the system. Uh, here, for instance, in order for you to have, um, in order for you to, to show traits of this gene, uh, both, um, both of the, uh, the chromosomes that you have are both copies of the gene um, must be somehow, um, the, you must be a carrier on, on, both, on both sides of your, your chromosome. In other words, you have to have both copies of that gene somehow broken. So here we have a normal child uh, who comes from a, um, a mother. Both of them have um, a chromosome where one copy of their gene in each, the mother and the father, one copy of the chromosome, or you know, one half of the chromosome has the bad gene, the other gene is okay. So they have no symptoms because their body is actually, I mean, their body, I know I'm simplifying this, but they have no, they have no um, symptoms because they are, if you will, the good gene to live, but they're still carrying a bad gene. Now that bad gene is then being passed on to these children. And this is what they call the Mendelian um, genetics, where you're seeing that one of these children, or a fourth of the children, um, is going to show signs of being normal. That means that they are not carrying the gene. And then you find that a half of these children, or two of the children out of the, out of the four, um, each of them are labeled a carrier. And what that means is that while they may not be showing signs of, of, of this gene, um, they are still holding the gene. That, that means that they still have a copy of the bad gene in them. And so their children, in turn, uh, could risk receiving this gene. Um, the affected child here is that child who actually has both the bad genes from, um, you know, two bad gene copies from the mother and the father. And so they are, what they say, affected. And so that means that they are actually showing signs of that, um, of that uh, bad gene. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, so the question is, what is the carrier gene then? It's, it's, it's dormant. It is dormant in many cases. Uh, I mean, it depends on the element, but I mean, typically it's, it's dormant. That means that um, you are living your life just fine. You have no, you have no idea that you even have this, 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 uh, this genetic um, issue. No idea at all. And then, of course, if your children are born, suddenly you start realizing that your children are, have something, um, I hate to say the word something wrong with them, but they have some medical challenge. And then you realize that, um, that they have some kind of genetic um, problem. You may have your own genetics checked. You may have your own blood and you know, t drawn and then check your own DNA. And you find out that actually you're a carrier for this, this gene. And so many people live their lives without ever knowing that they were ever a carrier for certain, for certain things. So, so yes, and so I'm thinking that uh, one thing that bioinformatics is becoming very good at now um, is checking for these types of, of genes. I mean, we, we've all heard of um, these groups online called like you know 23andMe and other types of areas and ancestry and those those kinds of websites. Um, I'm not sure. I can't really vouch for their science, but what they're doing is they're using bioinformatics types of tools um, to check for certain types of genetic, I guess, landmarks in people, um, and to see whether those same landmarks are appearing in members of the family. And so they can kind of say yes, these. The, this is a uh, common strain here, so maybe these are part of the same family. They're, they're looking at those kinds of things. But basically, though, the tools are just looking at the, at, the, at the genes, and they're determining that the genes have enough similarity to suggest that they're actually um, somehow related or they're somehow connected. But in this case, um, we're, looking, we're using those same tools to look at the genes and find out that if, if I look at mother's gene and I look at father's gene, I find out that they both have the same kinds of um, you know, they're, they're broken in the same way because if I look at somebody else's gene, who is what I would call normal or wild type, uh, they don't have that problem. And so therefore, I can, I, again, I'm comparing and contrasting things. But yes, it's very, it's very serious if you're a carrier because you, you don't know that you're a carrier. And so if you, if you have a, uh, if, 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 if an offspring has two parents who are carriers for the same genetic abnormality, then that offspring uh, could be, or that child could could be either a carrier themselves, they could be, t um, or they could be um, affected, or they could be normal. And so the thing is, though, that it's all statistics. And so you're looking at the the statistics of how that gene 
is able to, um, like, what are, what are the, what's the likeliness that that gene is going to transfer from the mother to the child and the father to the child? Um, here's something else. This is actually kind of interesting here. This is called X-linked inheritance. This is a, uh, a gene which, um, this is like male pattern balding, if you will, or even color, even color blindness, um, where if you look at uh, men, for instance, this is actually a true statistic. Something like, uh, what is it? Something like one in eight men uh, is colorblind red-green. That means they can't see the difference between red and green. It's pretty high. But for women, it's not that it's not that high, and so you, it's very it's very rare sometimes to find um, a, um, a a woman who is uh, colorblind red green. It does happen, but it's very rare. Um, and so, in fact, that reminds me of a story. There was a, a famous football game that was being played. I forget the two teams, but one team was wearing red, one team was wearing green, and a whole bunch of the fans began to complain that they they just couldn't see who was doing what because they're all a bunch of people wearing gray uniforms on the football field. And so, and I, I, I mean, my heart goes out to them. That's very, very difficult. But this is called an X-linked inheritance trait. And so what's going on there is that the, have on a, a, the, the mother could be um, uh, a, 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 well, the women's, I have to say, the women's genes are this, that she could be a carrier where for having this X-linked or this uh, sex-linked type of inheritance. But it means that she doesn't have uh, she is using a gene in her chromosome, which is the good copy of the gene that would have the color blindness. So she may have she has two copies of the gene on this X link on this X chromosome, where she gets um, um, I guess where she has this uh, she either has a, she has a normal one and then she has a, a, a defective allele. So she is using because she's not color blind she has the normal gene she's using the normal gene and I, I know that I'm making this overly simplified here but it's kind of how this thing works. But on this X-linked inheritance, remember that the, the, the gender of the, of the child uh, is determined by whether or not they have a Y uh, chromosome. And so they get an X from their mother and they get a Y from their father, that means that it's, it's a son. But if they have an X from their mother and they have an X from their father, then they're um, a daughter. And so the thing is that on the X chromosome, you have this copy of the color blindness gene or the male pattern balding gene. And the thing is, though, that if the mother is a carrier, and if she gives her only her, or she gives one of her copies of the gene to the child, or to her son, which is defective, then that's the only chance he gets. He only has one copy, and that's from the mother, because his father has given him the Y chromosome. And so therefore, there's no kind of backup of that, of that, uh, of that gene. I know that I'm making this very simple here, but I don't mean a backup, but it's like there's no second copy. However, if it's a girl, then she may get the bad color blindness gene from, um, from her, let's say she gets it from her mother, who's a carrier, but her father, who is not color blind, gives his daughter the, his X chromosome, which has no problems with the, the gene, and therefore she is not color blind. So, but the, the daughter could still be a carrier, so that means that her son could, could have, um, if, if she gave her son the bad gene for color blindness or male, male pattern balding, then perhaps he could become uh, he could become sick. Anyway, um, so you get the idea that, for instance, there are um, when you're talking about these X chromosomes, um, you have, for instance, uh, if you, if it's a daughter, then you have two X's, and that one is from the mother and one is from the father. If it's a son, you have an, a Y from the father, and so that means that, for instance, the um, if if your the copy of the gene that you have is on your X chromosome, if it's defective, then you don't have anything else to. To, you know, to, to go back on. It's like that's the gene that you get. That's the element that you, that you have. But if you're a woman, for instance, then you have two copies of that gene. So that means if one gene is not working, um, then your body could perhaps use the other. Now I'm making everything very, very simple here. There's a whole book written all about this. And so that's, this is not the, the end of the science. And so if you're interested, um, we, can, we, can, we can discuss this more. But I'd recommend them actually going online and, and you know, reading some of the papers that exist about all this. And there's, there's a whole bunch of profounder in this, in this area. <laughs> but anyway, I think you kind of get the idea here. Um, this is just another one here. I, was, I mentioned earlier about the, I just found this, this cute little picture online, but it's basically talking about like, you know, finding the probabilities. How do you know uh, that someone's going to get some kind of disease you know, or some kind of ailment based upon their, you know, the, the genes that they um, get from their parents? Well, this is part of um, the, the study of data uh, in bioinformatics, where you're looking at the data and saying, well, I know that um, the chance of this gene being transferred from the parent to the, to the, you know, to the offspring 
is this percentage, and I know, and then I know that uh, for the, the chance of the mother sending that gene down is this percentage, and the father sending that, that, that gene down is another percentage. I can figure out the expected percentages, or the, per the expected frequencies, I guess, of the offspring getting this, this disease, um, or this, this gene, this copy of this gene from the parents. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to happen, but this helps us to kind of you know, arrange our thinking in a, in, in a sense where we can decide uh, what kind of action we should take medically if we believe that perhaps our children have a 50% you know, chance of, of having some kind of disease or, or whatever it is from genetics. We could say, well, that's the, if those are the kinds of probabilities, uh, maybe we should start thinking about running some tests early on. And so it's, it, it does help us to kind of to, to manage our thinking and, to, and make decisions. But they're just expected, and statistically, if you say something is expected, um, it doesn't mean that that's exactly what's going to happen. It just means that that's, that's what the numbers say is going to happen, but in reality, it could be different. Anyway, um, like I said, though, there's a whole bunch of information out there. But really, what I wanted to spend some time, um, by the way, are there any questions at all? I don't want to just hurry everyone through this. Um, are there any, if there are any questions, let me know. I'm just going to pull up my notes here, make sure I've got everything out. Okay, so what I want to talk about today, though, is that we, especially here, you have these penguins, and they're cute, but we have these probabilities from this Mendelian uh, in inheritance study, where we have these percentages of like how many, uh, what they're of a particular allele getting from, you know, from the father or the father or the mother to the, the child. Um, and so how does that come to us? How do we know these things? Well, that's because we study data. And so um, in bioinformatics, really everything is data. One of the big things about bioinformatics is that you, um, we all know the same methods, we all know the same ideas, we all know the same theories, we all have the same approaches to working with work. The only thing that separates our work from somebody else's work, really, is the data. It's, it's the ability to go after specific types of data. And so I wanted to spend some time uh, discussing with you um, a little bit about uh, what, what kind of data is out there. And so I wanted to take you through two of the most prominent, I claim, two of the most prominent um, online databases um, where data actually come from. And so this is like how you would use, and this is like how you could, you could start your own research project. So let's go ahead and I'm going to see if I can copy this. Actually, I'm not going to copy this. I'll just rewrite this here. But one thing I use here is called Uniprot, which is uh, Uniprot is a giant. Um, I think I'll see this. Um, Uniprot is a giant uh, database, if you will. It's a website, but it's a database. It, it houses a database. It offers data, tools, but it offers things on working with uh, protein. A lot of the work in, in um, bioinformatics. Uh, deals with trying to find out like how one protein is going to mix with another protein. If you think about proteins, proteins are kind of like little, little cute animals. And it's like how they how they interact with each other is a study. So you might find that you know people are studying how how rabbits interact with cats. And like that's a study. Well, it's like they, there's a different reaction between rabbits and cats as rabbits with dogs. Well, with certain proteins, it's the same thing. Certain proteins might react differently with other types of proteins. And so you're, a lot of the, the research that, um, that, that I've been following in, in, in my time in bioinformatics uh, was looking at react with each other. And they call that PPI, or protein-protein interactions. Because a protein A and protein B might react as really, you know, they might, they might react very well, where they, they work together in some senses. But protein A and protein C um, maybe those proteins actually work against each other in some way. They're doing something that will... So you, sometimes you don't know that these things actually... Uh, you, like, sometimes you, you, you need to know these things if you're making, a, a, for instance, a medicine or some therapy that works with protein A and protein C, and you want, those, you want your medicine somehow to work with the strengths of both of those proteins. Anyway, um, this, is the, uh, this is the area or the website. Go ahead and try just type in um, Uniprot in your browser and have a look around. Um, this is your um, kind of like your 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 split your place where you can find all kinds of really interesting proteins, and one of the proteins that I was working with was called was something called Pink One, and I hope you can, everyone can see what I'm typing here. It's a bit small, perhaps, but Pink One, uh, Pink One was actually a very interesting uh, protein. It was involved in, in some major major stuff in my work. But um, it was a, um, my, actually my work was, was in something called post-translational modifications. And post-translational modifications is, um, it's like the fourth part, if you will, of the central dogma of biology, where you have DNA, which goes to RNA, which then becomes protein, 
But then what? Protein then has to be kind of folded into some kind of shape, some kind of twisted knot, some, something. It has to be folded so that it can actually do something useful. It's like, for instance, you could be, um, you could be a miner and you can mine ore for metal, like steel, let's say, iron. You pull, and then you, you smelt it, and you, or then you, you, you actually form steel bars, or I guess, in, um, and then what? It's like a, a brick of steel is not going to do any good. You have to melt it down again and then make it into a, a clock, or you make it into a desk, or you make it into something, so that it actually has some kind of use. If you go to, you know, to the store and you, and you just buy a, a brick of, 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 kind of a steel ingot, um, it's not going to be very handy. It's not going to, there's no use in that for you. you, can, you, you can, I guess you could use it as, as a doorstop, but if you wanted to like, you know, build with it or you wanted to make it into something, into, you wanted to build a, a chair or a table or a piece of furniture, um, that shape of that metal is not going to do anything for you. <clears throat> so in the same sense, when you're creating protein, you have DNA, which then you, know, you, you transcribe to get RNA, and then RNA is then um, translated to give you protein. Um, but then what? In order for your body to make any use out of this protein, you have to do something with it. You have to bend it and fold it into a specific kind of type of what they call a conformation, and then that will give you this um, this this building block, if you will. You can start using it to make hair or skin or bone or whatever you want to make. So one of the proteins that I was looking at was something here called Pink One, which is just one of the many many different types of proteins out there. But it was looking it was working with something called it was a cellular stress type of protein. They used it to, there were many studies out there that, that studied this protein and its, um, its reactions um, with cellular stress. Remember before I was telling you that I was working with reactive oxygen species, which is a cellular stress? I was looking at how proteins interact with, um, with age and, and microgravity. Like if you sent a person up into space, uh, how does their muscle mass break down? That's a stress. It's a stress, and you're, and you're basically subjecting their, their muscles in their legs uh, to stress. And so one of the, the, the types of proteins that, that has been studied to try to figure out how, how stress can, can interact with, or how it can, can um, interfere with the, the, you know, the, with the, I guess, the living conditions of a protein, is how Pink One has been, I mean, how, how Pink One is, or is, is Pink One. They've, 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 they've been studying Pink one and um, and cellular stress, pink one as it's been ex uh, exposed to stresses. But what pink one does, and you can see right here in in this database, is pink one is uh, it protects against mitochondrial stress. So that means that your mitochondria in your cell are the so-called energy producers. They produce your ATP. Is that right? And they, they create this ATP, and this is supposed to uh, keep your cells powered, and, and you have all this energy that's, that, that keeps you going. And the idea is that, that the more energy you need, the, the more your cells will produce some, some mitochondria. So those, those people who are athletes um, have more mitochondria in their cells than people who are not athletes, because they, they, they need more energy. And so your body is able to kind of produce producers of energy. Um, but the thing is, though, that when you are when you are running around and when you are, if you're exposed to heat or when you're exposed to like high salt or, or no sleep or, or, or whatever it may be, um, you have, um, you, you don't want that um, mitochondria uh, to be kind of, you know, <laughs> destroyed. You don't want it to, you don't want any damage to happen to that. And so you have this thing called Pink One, which is there to protect. It's a protection device here. It's a kind of a system that comes through and says, okay, I'm going to protect my mitochondria so that I can continue to run, I can continue to swim, I can continue to move, um, even though I'm undergoing some kind of cellular stress. That means I have, I have too much salt in my body, or I have too much, uh, uh, I don't know, it's like a, there's too much sugar, or there's too much insulin, there's too little sugar, there's too little insulin. It's like it's those kinds of things. And so you have certain types of, of proteins which are really like security guards inside the cell, and they are there to protect that the other main features do not break down. So it's, um, it's a very important protein. And so anyway, this is, but you can see this function here. It says protects against mitochondrial dysfunction during cellular stress by phosphorylating mitochondrial proteins. It kind of, can, it kind of if, if, it, if it realizes that the, the, the um, it's like a kind of a babysitter. If it says that the, the, it's becoming too stressful in the cell, it does something so that the mitochondria doesn't feel it. The mitochondria can continue working as it ever was, and you still have your energy, you still have your, your ability to move and to, and to run and do all these things, um, even though your body is stressed out. Anyway, 
Um, when I say stressed out, it's like you know, it's, it's undergoing some cellular level stress. Um, so anyway, but what I'm trying to say though is on this website, this database, you have seemingly all all proteins which have ever been um, ever been like worked with in, in science here. It's actually very exciting. And if you keep on moving through, you can find this like what's called the catalytic activity. If you're a biochemist, you may need to know this type of information to kind of give you an idea about how the protein actually works, like what's, what mechanism does it have to interact. And here we have, for instance, ATP, and then we have this uh, serial protein, the l serial protein, and this is how your ADP, ATP is converted to ADP, um, you know, in, in its, by this mechanism. This is a, um, it's, it's biochemistry, and so this is like about the energy production. It's actually quite exciting. But if you move down, you'll notice that there are the, some other things here. There's a binding site for ATP, you can see. Like, for instance, more biochemistry type of, uh, type of knowledge, where you can kind of get an idea about how the protein actually interacts. Proteins actually do have to make some physical co or contact with other types of proteins, and so in this case, um, the, physical, the physical part of the protein to make ATP um, is perhaps happening at, if I click on this graphical view, I can move down here, I can see that it's this, this piece right here, K. K, that's, your, that's your, your amino acid, or that's the building block of protein, which actually handles this reaction. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's just interesting here. So you have all this, then you have all this, you have all this inter interesting information. So if you're a biochemist, you may need to know that. And now you have this information for like seemingly millions of different proteins at your fingertips just by going to this website. Now, if you go down to the bottom here, um, this is um, this is your your Go molecular function here, which I think is called your 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 gene ontology. Gene ontologies are actually a very interesting but very frustrating area, I would say, of of bioinformatics. Uh, gene ontologies are really kind of what happens if you have many different uncoordinated um, organizations working on the same protein, um, and that they begin to start calling these proteins by it's the same thing but they all have different names for it. And so I may say it one way, you say it another way, uh, and so you'll say it some other way, you'll say it some other way. It's like we're all using different words for this thing, but actually we're talking about the same thing. And so you have to kind of keep track of all these different appellations or the nomenclatures of the, of the protein, and so they call this your, your gene ontology. And so you have to, you're looking at all the different ways you can refer to this. And you can, you, I mean, this is another very important area in bioinformatics, just keeping track of all the different names. I mean, imagine, for instance, that you have nicknames. You are, to all your friends, you're known by a different person. Some people might call you the big tuna, and someone else says, hey, it's the, it's the, uh, you know, the computer scientist. Someone else might call you, hey, professor. It's like someone else is, you know, that you have, a, everyone calls you something different, you know. And for my son, though, for instance, everyone calls him something different, and it's just amazing. It's like all his buddies have like a different name for him. It's like he has nicknames with everybody. And so for me, it's actually difficult to keep up with all Okay, so this guy just called you Big Tuna. This guy over here just called you the, you know, the, the something else. And it's like I have all these different names I have to keep track of. And so imagine now I have to create a database to keep track of all these names just to keep up on things. Nothing weird about that. But in the case of bioinformatics, though, each protein has names that everyone's calling it by and different types of, you know, different types of, you know, of, of, I guess of tags that people use to kind of reference it. And so we have this gene ontology part in this, in this, uh, in this website to help us keep track of, 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 you know, where we can, or to keep track of how, how to locate information about this particular protein. Here is the um, biological processes. Um, gene ontology, so this is like the nicknames that come to a protein uh, in terms of like, for instance, what it does. This is the cellular response to epoxia. Uh, this is the cellular response to toxic substance. And so these are all uh, names which have been given to this protein, which are perfectly valid, but of course there's many different names. And so this is really helping you to kind of organize, I guess, the protein into different types of groups so that you can, you can cluster it and figure out, okay, well, let me give me all the proteins which are responsible for auto um, or macro autophagy, or you know, eating, uh, the, the, the eating of, of, of bad stuff in, in, in the cell. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of different things here, and so it's actually very handy having these, these all right here because it helps you to kind of organ, order your research in some sense here. But another thing I, 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 I think is interesting, though, is that they have keywords, and so there's another way of, co of organizing this, this protein is by keywords. Like this is a kinase, or it's a serine theranine protein kinase. It's a transferase. Uh, it's an autophagy. 
It has all these it has all these different attributes to it, and so you can use those attributes to kind of uh, control or to you know to, to reference this protein. Um, but one thing that I, I did this and this is actually kind of interesting. This like gives you kind of a, a graphic about where this this thing is located. You can you can click around and see some of the graphics on, on the cell. Um, but one thing that I used this for was if I click on this um, PTM processing right here. There's a bunch of different things here we can look at, but I wanted to take you through here because this is, to me, most, most important. Um, but I worked in this area. This, is, this was actually my doctoral work by looking at, um, at this post-translational modification of PTM um, of this protein. And so what we're looking at here is, for instance, here is what they call a modified residue. Now, to give you an idea about what um, post-translational modifications are, and that is, it is that, for instance, if it's raining outside, you take your, you, you grab your, your raincoat and you walk to class and you don't get wet. If it's not raining outside, you just go out into the, you just, you just walk out of the, out of the house, you go to class and you don't get wet. Either way, if it's raining or if it's not raining, you don't get wet because if it's raining, you're wearing a raincoat and if it's not raining, then you don't need to wear a raincoat. But that's a kind of a modification that you're, that you do manually to protect your, your, your jacket or your sweater or whatever it is from getting wet. It's like you're taking some kind of step before you go to work or you go to class or whatever it is so you don't get wet. Well, your cells and your proteins do exactly the same thing. If there is too much uh, salt, say, in the, in the, in the solution of the, or in the, in the, near the cell or near the protein, then the protein does something and it doesn't worry. If, there's not an, if, there's, if, there's not too, if, that, if that salt isn't there, the protein doesn't do that thing, and it doesn't worry, and everything's okay. So what I'm saying is that the cell takes certain, or the, the protein in the cell takes certain types of uh, precautions so that if there's too much salt or if there's too much, you know, radiation or something, I don't know, um, it can take, it can, it can do something so that it doesn't, uh, it, it's, it's, um, its duties are not somehow impacted. It can still complete its duties, still work, do its functions, still live. Uh, even though there's this stress going on. And so that's what they call a modification, where the protein adapts. The protein wakes up one morning, it looks outside, and says, huh, that's interesting, there's a lot of salt. I better do something, and it does something, and then it's able to continue surviving, and it's not even aware that the salt is even causing any problems at all. It doesn't matter, it doesn't, the saline doesn't matter. And then one morning that same protein wakes up and it looks out and says, oh, there's no saline out there today. Okay, um, let's do this, and then again, it does something, and then it continues living, and it has no idea that there's that, that problem ever existed. And so it, the function is able to continue without any kind of obstruction. That's what they call by that's what's called by a, a post modification or post translation modification. After translation, you're modifying the protein. And so in my work, though, for instance, I was looking at these things, and I was, and I was looking at the at the uh, actual at proteins, for instance. And this is an, this is what the protein looks like in terms of its uh, its amino acids. This particular one. And I was looking to see, for instance, uh, where in the protein these types of mod these modifications actually happen. We'll talk about BLAST later on. BLAST, by the way, is just a big tool that allows you to compare this protein sequence across any, any other protein sequence which has ever been discovered. Kind of a big thing there. <laughs> but I wanted just to take you through this though, and just show you that you do have this information here now. And so if I go down, for instance, in, this, in the protein that I was looking at, this, uh, if I go down here, I can see that right here, this S, serine, at that position, this serine is actually what, is, that's like the, the, the button, if you will, that you push that makes this protein change its conformation so that it is able to uh, deal with this environmental stress. Now, remember when I was talking about the, um, uh, the uh, I guess, the, the frame shift mutations where you might have, a, you, you, your, your DNA changes uh, the, the, you might have a, a, a particular um, protein amino acid or protein building block, which also changes. So for instance, imagine we had a mutation right here uh, where it's not an S anymore, um, but rather it is a, it's not this S anymore here, but rather, let's just say this was, um, I don't know, leucine, it's an L or something, it's something different. It's not, but it's not this thing here. That is going to impact the whole production of your, of your the, the whole response to your, your um, reactive oxygen species or whatever the cellular stress is, because the thing that's supposed to react with it or the thing that's supposed to do something uh, isn't there to do the thing. It's kind of like, for instance, you sit down to your keyboard to write your paper, and then you realize that your roommate has taken your, your plug-in keyboard uh, to class, and now you have nothing to actually interact with your computer. The computer is there, 
but you cannot type anything because there is no keyboard. Bummer. So what are you supposed to do? You, you just wait for the keyboard to come back, and then you can start working on your computer. But in this case, if there's some kind of a, you know, a, a mutation here where that amino acid is gone, it's gone. You can't interact with that protein necessarily. And so that's why mutations are such a big deal, because these mutations will actually create some, some real havoc or some, a real problem in, in, um, in, in your cell, with in the, in the, in the health of the cell, if they happen, because it's like they're interfering with, with some basic functionality. Anyway, um, moving on to the thing here, we have a bunch of other modification databases. That means that somebody has, um, has put this, data, this protein into a database where they say this protein has been studied in this sense, and it does this, and it does that, and so therefore, here's the information. If you're interested, click on this button, and, uh, and you can see more about it in our database. But one thing I really did want to talk to you about, though, I wanted to tell you, um, is uh, you see how we have this, there's these, these publication buttons scattered around everywhere we go. Five publications down here. Uh, here's another publication here, three of them. Uh, here's one over here, one publication, uh, one publication. These are, um, this is a, a citation. That means that this is, this database is saying, or this information is, is, is uh, being cited. That means that the, the people who put this together are saying, we didn't make this up. This is actual real science here. This is a, there's a paper that exists online that says that such and such is true. And so for instance, if you don't believe us, click on these yellow links and you can find the paper yourself just as we did and you can read it and prove to yourself that this is actually true science. And so this is why I'm making such a big fuss about like for your, your final projects, um, you know, going into like using um, actual uh, peer reviewed papers um, it's because the big shots use it, like the people who made this website. But also, though, um, it's how you say that I know what I'm talking about. I know this is correct. This paper here, Park and Pink One and DJ uh, One from uh, former Ubiquitin 3 uh, E3 ligase complex promoting unfolded protein degradation uh, degradation is um, that is a um, a paper that's um, that is actually saying that that whatever the fact is that we're trying to we're, we're using here. Uh, it's true. It's actually been it's been vouched by several different people, like maybe you know five different uh, computer scientists and and biologists and mathematicians. Um, they have looked over this to make sure that the science is correct. Is the science they can show that the science is good, so that um, it's it's not um, it's not baloney. It's it's real stuff. And so you know that when you look at papers like or when you look at uh, websites like this, if you have all these citations around it. You know that the data is good. It, the data has some 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 value because it has been curated, or means which means that somebody has gone through, found this paper, read the paper, decided that that paper explains this data that they're putting on this website. They put the two together, and so now you know that the data is good. Yes, sir. Forgive me if this is already in the syllabus, but when do you um, want us to start planning for the final project? So the final, so there's a question, when is the final project actually coming out? Um, I'll just take a, a quick, sh I'll just show you quickly. Um, if you go to classes and you go to bioinformatics, I'll just pull up the syllabus. It's in there somewhere. Um, where is that here? Syllabus. Um, here's the syllabus. You look at the, um, the final deliverable is due on the 20th of May. 20, actually that should be, I should change the, <laughs> that should be 2021. I should change that, but it's still the 20th, it's the 20th of May uh, at 9 a.m. This time here, this is, or the class is the exam code J. If that doesn't mean anything to you, then that's okay. But what that means is that every, every class here has a, has a number or a letter attached to it, which says when you're taking your final exam. For us, we're J, and so that means that the 20th of May, uh, 2021, I should have changed it, I, I will do, uh, is our time to take our final exam. That's when we would normally take a final exam. But I don't do final exams because I find final exams are really kind of, well, they're not very important. I think that, they're, I think that a final project where you're actually working on your, using your own skills and you're harnessing your own data and working on your own analysis, I think that's actually much more fundamental to uh, what learning should be. Um, I think a final exam is, um, <laughs> I know that I, by saying this, I'm going against years and years and years of teaching theory. But I don't like final exams. I prefer projects because I think that the uh, projects is really what you're going to be um, asked to do. But um, everything that we discuss in this class is to get you ready for your project. I mean, everything that's really, my, my, my eyes are on that project so that you can deliver one of the most exciting projects ever. And I'm thinking that this project, we won't discuss it today, but this project uh, could be 
I mean, something you could show um, your potential, uh, I guess, potential employer, or perhaps if you're looking for an internship, you might be able to use your project to show people what you're made of. So that they give you that opportunity. Oh my God, I saw your project. Excellent work. Excellent stuff. I mean, really great analysis. So you'll you'll use this, and this could be your your ticket into a very interesting career in, well, I'm, I'm maybe bioinformatics, but certainly computer science in some way here, you know. But we will talk about that. We'll talk about all of this stuff here. So don't don't worry about uh, don't don't worry about that just yet. We'll, we'll we'll there's a moment for that in in class where we actually will spend some good time talking about the project. But it's due on the very day that the you know that the you know that our, our final exam would have been held. I do apologize for those of us who like, who prefer final exams. <laughs> I hope that this doesn't offend you. Um, anyway, so what I'm trying to say though is you have all this data that exists on, uh, on, this, on this website. And so it's, it's really quite an important thing. And so if you're working with proteins for your final project, um, for instance, you can do a search on this and find all kinds of things. We'll, we will we'll come back to this, this particular um, website again and again and again. And so we'll we'll actually go through each of these types of areas, and I think you'll see that they're, you know, it's, right, right now it's probably just over, you know, it's too much information. But I think that after a while you'll start getting used to like, looking at specific areas. This thing is actually uh, this is a this is how uh, this is a, a interaction, um, a, or what they call a binary interaction between proteins, and this is really saying that a study exists where this protein in human interacts with this protein pink one. And so they're saying that pink one actually has friends, if you will, in the cell, and these are the friends. This darker color is a better friend, a better interaction with that protein. So let's see, the T12 in human tends to interact with this HD human, which is related to pink one. But it's like they're, they react quite closely, whereas this over here, this lighter color of blue, if I'm reading this correctly, is saying that yes, they still react, but perhaps not as, it's not as, uh, they're not playing golf every weekend. Anyway, so you have all kinds of studies like this, and, and that, and knowing that those two those two proteins actually interact with each other, might help you to kind of get an idea that if I'm creating some kind of therapy that uses this protein, I better watch these other proteins because I know that those proteins are going to be in the neighborhood. So I need to make sure that those other proteins don't somehow get in the way of my interaction with my uh, with this protein. If I'm working with a, if I'm designing some kind of a therapeutic model. And we'll, actually, we'll see more about this when we get into um, 3D modeling of proteins. But when you're creating a therapy, you're actually creating some kind of a model that will allow this protein, in many cases, to dock onto it, actually physically connect to it, and then connect, and then stay put for a while, and to prevent this protein, which is uh, doing bad things, from connecting with other proteins. But if you have, for instance, a protein where it has its friends, its other proteins that it interacts with, Always around and getting in the way, then maybe you need to you need to know that so that you design your therapy molecule in a slightly different way. Um, we discuss all of this uh, later on, so this isn't like you. This is not the only time to talk to talk about this. The other big um, database that I wanted to, to talk to you about uh, today was the National Center for Biotechnology Informatics. This is actually quite exciting. Um, this is where your your DNA and RNA and also protein information would come from. But again, you have like seemingly like, you know, endless information here. Uh, one thing I look at, for instance, I'll just type in pink one here again, and to see what we got. Um, we've got a, again, it has some information about what the protein does. It's an induced kinase one. We have some information about what it's also known as, like AKA, BR, PK, and PARC6. You know, maybe that PARC6 is from Parkinson's, perhaps. Maybe it's from a Parkinson's study. But you can click on these genes, and you can get an idea. You're looking more or less not necessarily at the at the protein now. I mean, you're looking at the protein, but the, the concentration or the context, if you will, uh, is on the gene that gives us pink one. And so here is all information about the, the genes. And so here we have some graphical information down here where we're looking at a sequence of DNA. And you can see that these blocks, I hope you can see them here, these, this, this green block here, this is like your, your coding region that actually creates pink one. And so you're able now to kind of get an idea about where pink one is actually coded in the genome, uh, what the code looks like. Um, so yes, it's still the protein, but we're talking about the gene. Like, what is the gene that actually creates this protein? Which, which is important. And so if you're working with uh, mutations, for instance, if you find out that there's, you know, that some of your patients, for instance, have a mutation in their pink one protein, 
maybe it's not the protein that's going wrong, it's the, it's the gene itself. And so then you go to this website here instead of the gene. And so these are all different types of genes you can look at here. This is the, um, the gene from the, from one of the projects. And there's another gene down here for a different project and you're able to kind of like compare and contrast. And so you can see that, for instance, in this gene and this gene down here, I hope you can see what I'm doing. Um, you can see that the, the, basically the syntax is very, very these big squares that you see right here, those squares are like your, your landmarks or your, you know, they're, they're places of interest in that, in that gene. It's where something happens, maybe where the protein itself is created or where something goes on. But you can see that these places of interest or these landmarks uh, appear to be found in the same kinds of areas. Now, if you go down, what is this one down here? This is another gene. This is uh, slightly different, I can see. I can see that it's slightly different because where I am right now, if you, if, you, if you follow along, you'll see, if you compare this to this to this, you'll see that there's this chunk of, of code here in the middle, which is this piece right there, what I'm actually what I'm poking on right here. But you see that's, that looks a little bit different from, from everything else. And so it's, it's a slightly different gene. But what I'm saying though is that this website allows you to kind of explore some of these subtle differences between genes. So you can say, okay, well, I know that the, the working gene looks like this, and this I'll call the wild type. That means that this is the gene that appears to be the one that gives you the protein that, that does what it should do. However, I know that when it, if I have a change, and by this one I'm saying is I, when, I, when, I, when I take this gene and I compare it to the gene that I've sequenced in the lab from a patient or somebody who, an organism uh, who has some kind of a, 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 you know, where the gene doesn't do what it's supposed to do, then that's, um, that I can see that where the, where the differences are. And, and that difference may be the reason why the protein's not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, there's a bunch of things here. There's some, um, you have some interesting uh, types of, this is the RPKM. <laughs> This is just more uh, kind of analyses of like different types of reactive areas inside that gene or different types of, um, you're looking at the uh, at different type of types of properties of the, of the gene, where this gene can be found. This is the, um, I think what this is telling me is that I can find these genes in all these different areas here, gallbladder. Let's see, number of copies, number of samples here. It's kind of hard to click on this stuff here. But I think that it's, it's telling me something about where the gene can be found. There seems to be so much information in here. But what I'm trying to say though is that um, all the um, all of this stuff here is 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 available for free. That means that all of these things. I mean, you, you, you may not know exactly what all of these things are, but these things are are used by different types of research scientists. So, for instance, like when I was using one of my studies, um, I was using the interactions. I was using this part here, but I never used like for instance some of this other this pathways from. PubChem, I never use that at all. And it, it, you, you're not, you don't have to use everything here, but you just have to know what you want to use, what kind of data you need, and then you can probably find that data on this website here. So if I go ahead and click on, for instance, um, let me see if I can click on this interactive. There we go. This is actually kind of interesting. I think that uh, if I just go down to the end here, let me see something here. Um, so, oops, what's that? So here, really, this is a this is like a, a this is a file in the protein. So, for instance, I now have the protein. This is what the protein should look like um, for this particular. This is the your, your amino acids. It's not DNA. This is protein language now, where you have leucine, serines, uh, you know, tryptophan. We have all these things uh, all here. These are all. This is your, the makeup of your protein. So. Uh, you can kind of get an idea about all the pieces of the protein. So what this record is about is, is going through the protein and like talking about landmarks. And of course, you have all the keywords that are used to describe that protein so that you can look it up in, in, uh, in research uh, pa in, in, in papers here. You can find out, for instance, in this particular protein, this was extracted from Homo sapiens or people, but it doesn't mean that that's, uh, I mean, you can, you can also find and you can find pink one in dog or cat or rat or human. I mean, it seems like it's everywhere. And you can actually run an analysis, and we will do it in class, um, when we talk about BLAST, we'll actually look to see how closely our genes are, some of our genes are, uh, to animal genes, which is extraordinary because you think to yourselves, there's no way that I am like a rat. I mean, I'm totally different. I mean, we, are, we have totally different attitudes on things. And uh, the thing is, though, that if you look at your genes and, and their genes, you'll see that actually there's <laughs> <laughs> You're very similar. So when someone calls you a rat, like you lying rat, you can say, you know, <laughs> that's your defense. You know, 
Anyway, but still, what I'm saying is it, 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 there's a lot of similarity. But these, this is, I, I'm saying all this stuff here just so that you have an idea that when it comes time to actually working on some of your projects, uh, the data is available to you. You have all the data in the world. You just have to decide for yourself what that data should be. So I've taken you through these websites here. We will go back to these websites um, and do some more kind of in-depth work here. But I want you now to, we have, I guess, um, about seven minutes or something. Um, I want you to spend the rest of the time in class uh, going to this, um, going to the, the website for the class. In fact, this class right here, if you go to the, my main website for this, for this uh, class, on the, front of the, on the front here, links to bioinformatics resources, if you click on that right here, um, throughout the, the years and things that I've used, like some of the, web, the websites that I've used, these are, these are websites that provide certain tools or certain datas or types of data that I've used, data sets that I've used. Um, they're in no particular order. I just put them up here because um, when I'm doing my own work, I, I, I refer back to these things and I'm thinking that it's not just me. Uh, I had, um, let's see, last uh, uh, two summers ago, I had a couple of students who were who are also working in bioinformatics types of themes for their, their summer projects. And so we were all using these, these links here. And so I just thought I'll just put them on the, way, on the main website so that people can get to them.